Hello and welcome, wrestling fans, to Cheap Shot Entertainment. This is another retro review. And today we are going to be looking at Backlash 2003. It is the fifth edition of the Backlash event. And uh, it is a joint pay-per-view between Raw and SmackDown. Obviously, at this point, the brand split had happened. So it was sometimes a Raw pay-per-view, sometimes a SmackDown pay-per-view. But the main shows were always dual-branded. And some of the shows around those main shows as well. It was uh, aired live to pay-per-view audiences and 10,000 strong in the arena on April the 27th, 2003. And it was from the Worcester Centrum Arena in Worcester, Massachusetts. It has the theme song, official theme song of Remedy by Cold. And there's probably a good reason that you've not heard of Cold. It might be because of this song, but I, I couldn't even remember them. You know, sometimes the theme songs for pay-per-views you really do remember, other times you don't. And uh, the main event was The Rock versus Goldberg. Goldberg finally signing with the WWE after his guaranteed contract had run out. How nice. Um, the arena appears in WWE 2K23. Of course, that is following the storied career of one John Chayner. And uh, it also appears in WWE 2K15 and WWE... Here comes Smackdown, here comes the pain. Um, just before we kick off into the main part of the review and the rundown of Backlash 2003, I'm going to take you through what happened on Sunday Night Heat. And it's very quick. Scott Steiner defeats Rico. Tells you everything you need to know about Scott Steiner as well. And uh, yeah, the fact that he just was not ready um, to make a comeback at this point in time. But without further ado, let's get into the pay-per-view. And uh, I hope you do enjoy. This is awesome! This is awesome! So, our first match of the evening is SmackDown. And it is for the WWE Tag Team Championships. It is Team Angle, Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas, defending against Los Guerreros, made up of Eddie and Chavo, of course. Um, this match starts off really well, um, very technical. Both teams are very sound with the ground game and the technical wrestling. And... Uh, yeah, it, it starts off quite slow, quite measured, uh, feeling out process by both teams. Uh, obviously, Team Angle feel like they've got the edge on the Guerreros when it comes to this, but the Guerreros showing that they are very technically sound themselves, obviously coming from a very historic wrestling family. And... Uh, yeah, it builds up a little bit and uh, it is Team Angle that get the better of the Guerreros. Uh, the heat goes on to Eddie. He is desperately trying to make a tag any way he possibly can. Um, but he always gets cut off. He always manages to get cut off by either Charlie Haas or Charlton Benjamin in some way, shape or form, finding himself in in sleeper holds, side sleepers, uh, rear chin locks with the knee planted firmly in the back. So it makes it more difficult to get out of. Very sound base wrestling. And uh, it isn't until Charlie Haas makes, I would say, probably makes a mistake here in trying to uh, flatline Eddie Guerrero into the buckle, but he buckle he sends him into his own corner where Chavo is waiting, thusly making the tag. Chavo comes out in 
really in hot and heavy style takes out both Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin uh, really gets the shine here and uh, starts taking out both of them uh, stacks them into the corner Shelton rolls out uh, manages to get the better of Charlie Haas and uh, just as he's going for the back suplex he is a little bit too close to the edge of the ring and Shelton Benjamin trips the leg only for Charlie Haas to get the victory as he holds the foot underneath the rope but the referee doesn't see it and obviously doesn't have the momentum to kick out. Your winners of this match and still WWE Tag Team Champions are Team Angle and of course something I didn't mention right at the beginning of this is that Team Angle come out with a picture of Kurt Angle and dedicate the match to them and it's brilliant they put him on they put the picture outside the ring with the little medals on the side and everything and it's really cool you knew something was going to happen with that and so it did after that match uh, Charvo gets uh, catapulted into Charlie Hoss and Shelton Benjamin thusly taking out the picture as well and uh, the Guerreros decide to do what they do best and steal the championships. Now, I was a bit confused at this point because the Guerreros come in to me as, well, I hate, I hate the phrase, but they are tweeners, but they're getting cheered. But they are more heelish in this match than Team Angle. Um, which confuses me a little bit. Obviously, there was the bit at the end of WrestleMania where Kurt Angle shook the hand of Brock Lesnar, so that makes sense. But Team Angle really is should be more heelish than this. They they probably wouldn't. Well, they could work as a a face. It's been twenty years, so I can't I can't remember. Um, exactly, but I know Kurt Angle's out and that's why the match has been dedicated to them. They've been given a lot of time here and it shows. It shows how much faith they had in these four uh, to put on a really good match, to open the show, get people warmed up and thus they did. We go into the back then and uh, we see the Guerrero celebrating as if they'd won the championships and obviously they haven't making their way to their designated low rider, which they jump into. They've got the uh, fantastic horn going off as well. Uh, you know, the, the La Cucaracha horn. Um, and they press that a couple of times, and they drive off into the night after Eddie's done the bouncy thing in his car, which is the hydraulics. Uh, all the time making, uh, making Team Angle look a bit, like divvies um so the match itself i'm going to award four four cheap shots out of five but the ending confuses me so i'm going to knock off cheap shot off for that and it's going to be three and a half cheap shots for me um because i'm a sucker for a story in wrestling i think it's important to have stories in wrestling but this one just confused me a little bit i get the Guerrero's lie, cheat and steal and they were lie, cheat and steal um, they were outdone with this one um, and I get that because they got the integrity and the intelligence and the intensity of Team Angle however this just didn't didn't sit right <laughs> in the grand scheme of things so I'm going to go with the final rating of Three and a half cheap shots out of five. And believe me, that hurts. But I just didn't like the ending. Nah, there you go. We move on. So we move into the back again. Uh, after the Guerreros have made their getaway. And we see Test hitting on Tori. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, Tori says, you know, you're going out with my best friend and 
stop coining her and all that kind of stuff. This is very male chauvinistic. She tries to walk away, pulls back, forces her to kiss. And as Tori's walking away, you get uh, Sable walking out of a room. Very um, breaking the fourth wall here is something that you'd find in a WWE game at this point. It's quite hokey, but yeah, you, you know something's going to happen with that later on down the line. Um, so we move on to the next match. It is Sean O'Hare versus Rikishi. And Sean O'Hare has aligned himself with the rowdy one, Roddy Piper, uh, who walks down to the ring with a lovely bunch of coconuts and introduces Sean O'Hare as the next generation, the future of WWE. Couldn't be further from the truth, but you've got to say, he's impressive. He's six foot odd, uh, built, uh, he's got strength, got speed he's got he's got everything he's very athletic um one of the people that would have been uh w wcw's future had it gone any further than 2001 surprised it took this long to get him in but there you go that's that's that isn't it um so yeah we get is this is definitely not a technical masterpiece obviously rikishi uh, it was victim of a coconut shot on SmackDown before Backlash. And uh, he is out for revenge. Uh, chases Roddy Piper around the ring. Tries to get one over on Rikishi. Does share Sean O'Hare. Rikishi ducks and slams him into the steel stairs. And then subsequently into the apron and back into... The ring and the match starts. Rikishi on top with this one. Um, where it all backfires is Piper's um, timing. I don't know if this was all supposed to be there, but they made the referee look absolutely stupid here. Piper was literally climbing into the ring with a coconut in his hand, and the referee did nothing. <laughs> I mean, I... When I'm on shows, I'm a manager. And there has been times where it has been dead obvious where I've got something. But I've learned from that. And obviously, Piper's coming back after a long time. So I give him the benefit of the doubt. It does take a while to get that timing right. But it kind of takes things away from the actual match. His antics on the outside take away from the match. The role of the manager is to blend in, get the crowd going when it's needed, but not do too much. I think Piper's involvement in this kind of ruined the match. It was a showcase of Sean O'Hare, and it did a lot for him, um, In for me, in this match. Obviously, didn't do a lot for him in the future, unfortunately, uh, because Sean O'Hare could have been main event he could have been at least at least mid card you know upper mid card and on the fringe of main event but uh yeah people are more focused on Roddy Piper than Sean O'Hare which is a shame so like I say where it all came down is uh Rikishi going for the stick face after the charge in and the uh butt bump uh Sean O'Hare goes down Goes for the stink face. Sean O'Hare reverses it and quite hilariously call, calls it. I've never seen that reversed before. He's literally sticking his arse in his face. It could be reversed loads of ways. Loads of ways. But Sean O'Hare pushes Rikishi in the butt where he does a butt bump. <laughs> and sells it like, like nobody's business. Um, and that's where Sean O'Hare comes back, and Rikishi does get back on top. Piper walks in under the referee's nose, and this is exactly what I was talking about earlier, under the referee's nose with the coconut, passes the coconut to the referee uh, and tries to play innocent, turns round. Riki actually, no, does he? Yeah, he turns round and uh, says, oh, no, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Um, and at that point, 
he tries to uh, hit Rikishi. Rikishi blocks it and hits Piper with the coconut. And again, he sells like a, like he's been shot. And uh, Sean O'Hare hits the reverse de- uh, reverse driver. And well, you know, what what would he what would it be called? It's not a Death Valley driver. Yeah, I suppose he is a reverse Death Valley driver actually, but. Yeah, um, so twists into it, hits that move, that driver move, and picks up the victory. Big victory for Sean O'Hare. Shame the match had a lot taken away from it by Roddy Piper, which is a shame I'm even saying that, because Piper's brilliant. Only today I found a, a film on Amazon Prime that's got Roddy Piper in it. I'm like, Yes. Yes. Um. So yeah, it's it's a real shame. It's it's not much of a match. It's like I say, it's a good showcase of Sean O'Hare, but the focus was on Roddy Piper and not on Sean O'Hare. So therefore, I'm only going to give this two cheap shots out of five. As Roddy Piper walks away into the back with a bloody noggin. We move on to the next match. So we go into the back again next and it appears that Sable has a little bit of a beef with Tori Wilson. Um, Previously on the Smackdown we did have a bikini contest circa 2003 and uh, yeah Tori looked absolutely gorgeous as she always did but Sable decided that uh, she wouldn't win and then attacked her. So now it's time to stir the pot. She goes to find Stacy Keebler, who we find is eating a very small salad, and uh, tells Tori, tells uh, Stacy, there we go, tells Stacy that uh, Tori is, uh, is, is after test and uh, she's been sending her messages and they saw them kissing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and Stacy's not very happy. She chucks her food down on the floor and walks out. We then join the tag team champions, Rob Van Dam and RVD, over on Raw, the world tag team champions. And uh, it appears that Chief Morley has added himself into the match as the special guest referee. Um, but... Uh, you know, RVD's like, let's go and... I like having these titles, and Kane's like, yeah, let's go and kick ass. So, subsequently, that's what they do. They head towards the ring. The next match is a tag team match, and it's for the World Tag Team Championships. The champion champions, rather, are Rob Van Dam and Kane, and the challengers are the Dudley boys, Devon and Bubba Ray, respectively. Of course, Chief Morley. Sean Morley, also known as Val Venus back in the day, the porn star, um, is uh, the special guest referee. And, and he doesn't get involved too much. He stays to one side. He, he counts the near falls, and there's plenty of them. Obviously, the Dudley boys' game here is to ground Rob Van Dam, who is the quicker of all four of these guys. And... Uh, that high-flying style. If you stop him from throwing his kicks and his strikes and his jumping and things like that, then there's a good chance they'll win. So there's lots of chin locks, lots of rest holds. Um, Kane comes in like a house on fire when he gets the uh, hot tag and takes out both Dudleys. Um, All this time, there's about a good three minutes of all four guys being in the ring at one time. So it was difficult to keep charge of um, in terms of who was legal and things. But this this is one of those instances where I suppose you just let it go. You're not going to control four guys if you just one person uh, in a striped shirt. So the hijinks ensue. And it uh, it leads up to Kane going for a choke slam. Uh, Chief Morley giving him the low blow. 
uh, Bubba Ray going for the pin and getting a near fall. It's at this point where Chief Morley decides that this is no good. So he goes to strike RVD and uh, misses and hits Bubba Ray. Devon then starts beating on Morley and everything breaks down. We get a choke slam into a big boot and then a choke slam finish um, into the five star frog splash from RVD. Referee comes down, counts to three. You are still looking at your tag team champions on Raw. World tag team champions are still RVD and Kane. All the time, Bob Ray and Dudley seem to have turned face. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's a reasonable match. I'm going to give it two and a half cheap shots out of five. Like I say, Morley kept, kept out of it right until the end, and it did work. It made sense, so... Why not? And uh, we move on. So we move on to Stacy now, uh, confronting Tori in the women's locker room. And that leads to a massive brawl breakdown of the Divas locker room, uh, where half of them are saying, let them fight, and the other ones are trying to split them up. But then we move into the next match, which happens to be the women's championship match. Your champion is Trish, uh, showing a bit of footage from Raw the previous Monday. It appears that the Dudley boys had attacked Trish under orders of Chief Morley and uh, injured Trish's uh, ribs. Uh, that didn't, you know, that, that was a massive contributor to her injury but also Jazz then gave her the her finishing move and dropped her on top of a table the table wasn't set up it was just in the uh, in the prone position on the floor but still it you know you still have to take the bump so the story is being told here I love a good story in wrestling and the story is that Trish's ribs are injured and naturally Jazz, being the veteran that she is, is going to go after those ribs. The opponent, as I've already mentioned, is Jazz. So you've got a champion who has worked so hard, and I will always say this, no one's worked harder than Trish in wrestling in recent years to get to where she is or where she was Um being champion and things like that over the last 20 odd years because she came from valet to predominant champion dominant champion actually uh, picking up the championship several several times jazz however has come from a different environment she's come over from ecw and uh, is very much in control of her own destiny she has learned the art of wrestling uh, for many many years and she's backed up by none other than Theodore Long uh, let me holler at your player um, because that is the promo at the beginning of this match um, and uh, Jazz says that the bitch is back the bitch is black uh, yes not only is it sexist in 2003, but mildly racist as well. But uh, it is a sign of the times, and that's the way it is. But let's get on to the match, because the match is actually... It doesn't actually get a lot of time, but the match is actually good. Um, and again, testament to Trish on working hard to get to that status. And Jazz just being... a ultimate professional and so same with Teddy Long as well uh, he knows when to jump in when to not jump in what to do at certain times and he did it um, so there's a bit of grappling in the in this match to start with um, Jazz going after those ribs they lock up again uh, Trish takes Jazz down with a go behind and a uh, just a normal waist lock takedown uh, she works the arm for a bit she transitions beautifully into an STF um, from a Boston Crab, which is a 
uh, put on jazz after jazz put it on trish and uh yeah this is where the match breaks down because there's uh a chick kick near fall a strategy faction and this is where teddy long throws his shoe at trish i mean honestly who throws a shoe uh, only certain people get that reference uh, but yeah, what, what a line from Austin Powers. Anyway, uh, yeah, throws his shoe, blames it on a fan. Trish gets up from trying to going for the pin, and uh, throws the shoe back at Teddy Long. At this point, Jazz gets the roll up and uh, holds on to the ropes for a cheat to win finish. A uh, very cheap finish. Uh, to a what was a really good match but like I say Teddy Long knows when to get involved and he did a good job here it was so insanely nuts to throw a shoe that no one expected it I've seen this pay-per-view a couple of times and yeah it's um <laughs> that I never thought I'd see but there you go maybe I'll use it in one of my matches I don't know um, but yeah, I'm really impressed by this match. I'm going to give it three and a half cheap shots out of five. Um, they never got a lot of chance to shine the Divas back in 2003. So yeah, this match was good and they made it good for what they could, um, what they could do with it. We move on. So we move on next. It's another backstage segment with Booker T talking to Shawn Michaels about their match later on in the night. Asked him if he's ready. The camera zooms over to Kevin Nash. Says he's not worried about Shawn Michaels being ready. He's worried about Kevin Nash being ready. Big Sexy is always ready. We then go on to the next match. It is The Big Show versus Rey Mysterio. It is a true tale of the tape. Because Big Show outweighs and is twice as tall as Rey Mysterio. But Mysterio has always had a big fight for a little dog. So, you know, he comes out, he has a game plan. He tries to use his quickness to take down the big show but even his strongest strikes are just not good and strong enough to take down the big redwood and it does come into play um quite often in this match Rey Mysterio looks like he's getting uh, a good uh footing in this match after big show gives him a chop to the back and sends him to the outside he searches for a chair gets the chair Big Show going after Rey Mysterio, pushes the referee out of the way. Rey Mysterio uses the chair. This just angers the Big Show, and uh, that would lead to the finish. Rey Mysterio trying to hit the West Coast pop. Big Show catches him, smashes him into the floor with the choke slam. There is no getting out of that. Big Show wins. This is short and sharp, but it does exactly what it needs to do. And uh, I'm going to give it two cheap shots out of five after the bell. The EMTs come down, uh, strap Rey Mysterio to a backboard. And uh, this is probably one of the most famous uh, scenes in SmackDown history. Big Show walking back down to the ring, picking Rey Mysterio up on the backboard and swinging him like a baseball bat into the into the post and uh, yeah Rey Mysterio falls on his face Big Show looks really angry and all the fans shout holy shiitake um, we then go into the back again and uh, we get a interview an interview with uh, Chris Jericho Ric Flair and Triple H it's Lillian Garcia conducting the interview they are unbelievably confident about their match later on their six-person tag and uh yeah 
uh, we move on. Another backstage segment. It is St- uh, Stacey Keebler confronting Tori Wilson again. Trying to attack her. Tori Wilson throws Stacey into a, uh, a, a chest, a tall chest type thing with a box on top of it. The box falls on Stacey's head and uh, Scott Steiner appears. Uh, yes, and this is all part of the show. Uh, Scott Steiner appears and uh, tries to carry Stacey off. And uh, Test comes around the corner and says, what are you doing with my girl? And um, Scott Steiner then puts her down and says, I think Stacey wants to know as well. So we move on now to the next match, which is John Cena versus Brock Lesnar. And a uh, nice promo package shown before the match. Showcasing the feud that has been able to be built up between Brock Lesnar and John Cena. John Cena would walk down to the ring cutting his usual rapping promo and mentioning WWE champions of the past including the Iron Sheik. Uh, he would be confronted by Brock Lesnar as he, as he made his entrance and uh, would cower on the outside as the explosions hit from the ring posts. Um, so this would start with a jump start by John Cena. Wouldn't take long for Brock Lesnar to come back out on top of this one, uh, sending John Cena into the announce desk and rolling him back in before John Cena uh, quickly reverses a an Irish whip and goes back out to the outside. It was this point that John Cena had gotten the upper hand on Brock Lesnar and uh, busted the champion open again, opening that old wound that he had created on SmackDown previous after a brutal match with a train that the that. Uh, the challenger had set up for Brock Lesnar uh, to wear him down, to soften him up, if you like, so John Cena could take the championship. Um, he then, uh, Brock Lesnar would then get the upper hand. He would be cut off again by Cena, uh, who would get ultimately very frustrated that he couldn't put the champion away. And um, we got... Um, John Cena then picking up the chain, trying to hit Brock Lesnar with the chain. That would backfire. He would walk straight into the F5 and Brock Lesnar would pick up the victory here. Still champion, Brock Lesnar. I'm going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five. It's not perfect by any means. However, it does showcase two of the greatest um graduates of the fcw system way back then the uh, developmental florida championship wrestling before it became nxt and uh, these two came through with the likes of batista randy orton shelton benjamin charlie hoss it was just a smorgasbord of top tier talent that was coming through at this point in time and very exciting time it was as well to have most of these people on SmackDown, which was considered the B show at the time. However, in 2002, 2003, SmackDown was the only program I could watch and I enjoyed every single minute of it. And it's really showing on pay-per-views as well how much talent SmackDown had compared to Raw at this point in time. But then Raw had its own talent as well so you know it was a good time to be a wrestling fan in 2003 and i for one like the ruthless aggression era even though a lot of people do not we move on to the next match so we move on to the pre main event now it is the six man tag match uh, the world heavyweight champion triple h chris jericho and the nature boy Woo! Ric Flair take on Kevin Nash. Five time, five time, five time, five time, five time world champion Booker T and the heartbreak kid, the show stopper Shawn Michaels. Um, 
for the amount of talent that's in this match, it should have been really enjoyable. But I've always said this about multi-person matches. Unless it's something like a Survivor Series where there's a stipulation. They're just there to be on the card. Now, I don't know the reasoning behind the six-man tag. Obviously, Chris Jericho and HBK had had their dealings prior to this. Booker T, Triple H also. Uh, obviously, Kevin Nash coming back. Uh, Triple H giving him the ultimatum, saying, are you going to go with HBK? Are you going to go with Triple H? Triple H then attacked him, gave him a pedigree and made his choice for him, basically. Uh, so that's how he's in this match. Kevin Nash looked good. In this match as well, which is great considering he hadn't been back for, well, I mean, it, we're talking about over a year, I think now. Because it was about, yeah, it was 2002, wasn't it, that NWO came back. And um, obviously HBK looks fantastic because it's HBK. Again, less time, but a very active competitor since SummerSlam. 2002 and Booker T is just Booker T. Booker T is awesome. Um, and then on the opposite side, you've got Triple H, Chris Jericho. Triple H is going through a bit of a lull at this point in time, even though he was World Heavyweight Champion. Um, he was just sort of entitled to everything and uh, gradually taking out WCW guys just to kill WCW even more. And uh, Ric Flair, even though he was. In his twilight years at this point in time. He was looking good as well. Did what he needed to do. Didn't need to do a lot of high flying or anything like that. Ric Flair was never known for that anyway. And he, he contributed to the match. Now as far as match structure goes. It broke down pretty quickly as you can imagine. Um, and then it sort of turned into a bit of a free for all. So. There's not much that I can give you in terms of structure for this one because it was really difficult to follow. Uh, and, and like I say, for me, it wasn't enjoyable at all. Uh, it didn't hold any sort of ooh, grandeur and all that kind of stuff uh, because the title wasn't on the line. If the title was on the line, there might have been some deception between the face team. But yeah, it's a standard six-man tag. Um, that was mediocre. I've seen some decent six-man tags, six-person tags, whatever you want to call them. And uh, this one was not one of those. Uh, Triple H comes in at the end. I'm not going to give you the full match structure because it, it's not, there's no real structure to this at all. Um, towards the end, uh, Ric Flair has Shawn Michaels in the figure of four. Chris Jericho hits the lion salt. Kevin Nash is on the outside ready to put Triple H through the table with the power bomb. Uh, Kevin Nash jumps back in and saves Shawn Michaels, takes out Jericho and Flair is about to give the jackknife power bomb to Chris Jericho, Triple H comes in. Uh, this at this point, the referee is down as well, um, and uh, Triple H comes in with the hammer and hits Kevin Nash over the head <laughs> for the win. Not even convinced that Triple H was the legal man, uh, and, and Nick Patrick to say he got bumped out of the ring. I mean, it was a it was a wicked ref bump, bumped out of the ring. And I've seen him sell so much longer for lesser things. He was up quickly to do the pin, do the pinfall count. So Triple H gets the pinfall over Kevin Nash. No redemption story there. And um, yeah, they go away, the winners. Uh, I can't give this a big score. I'm going to go... One cheap shot out of five, not enjoyable, bit of a free-for-all, overbooked, and just a reason to get people into the match. 
there you go we get a an update on Rey Mysterio next uh, having had his uh, uh, whole body swung at the post like a baseball bat and uh, the Cole and Taz give an update and they say his vital signs are good um, <laughs> I love the way that color commentary works it's brilliant uh, vital signs are good uh, but obviously he's, he's in a local med medical facility being monitored. We move on to the next match. So we move on now to our main event of the evening. Going to the back and uh, Terry is interviewing The Rock in a style that only The Rock could deliver. And uh, yeah, he's thoroughly entertaining and by the end of his promo considering people were booing him when he came back people were cheering him obviously different states have different ways of dealing with things and uh, yeah um, this is no different but uh, yeah he goes out ready to uh, take on Goldberg Goldberg comes to the ring and he is booed out of the building before he even starts considering about a year later he would be leaving the company. Um, pretty much no one wanted to see Goldberg <laughs> come in. I mean, yeah, a bit different now. Um, you know, he comes back as a as a legend and does his thing. But yeah, this this match was your standard. Goldberg would pick up the victory. Um, it, it was a bit of a throwaway match again. It's a shame because this pay-per-view is actually really good up until the last couple of matches. And whilst this is better than the six-man tag, um, The Rock definitely carries this. And uh, unfortunately, picks up the L at the end. Bill Goldberg, three spears, uh, hitting The Rock with a rock bottom uh, about halfway through the match. Uh, the Rock doing his cowardly heel stuff. But people were chanting Rocky and booing Goldberg. And uh, this is what makes it very different <laughs> to uh, everything that I'd seen before on this pay-per-view. So, yeah, Goldberg wins uh, with three spears and a jackhammer. Um, and, uh, yeah, the Rock goes away with his tail between his legs and, and Goldberg comes away with a, a victory. Obviously, it would set him up to... Go against Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship coming up um, in the next couple of months. So, uh, yeah, that is Backlash 2003. Oh, yeah, I'm going to give this, uh, this match a rating of two and a half cheap shots out of five. Like I say, a bit of a throwaway. A bit like the uh, match between Hogan and The Rock at uh, No Way Out. Um didn't really do much. The Rock was already in Hollywood. Uh, still a great performer. Obviously great on the mic. But yeah. Um, it is what it is. Uh, like I say, two and a half cheap shots out of five for this one. But the whole pay-per-view, uh, the pay-per-view as a whole um, was very good. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's one that uh, I haven't seen for a while. But there's still some very good stuff in here. Um, the uh, backboard to the post uh, is, is quite memorable. I saw it on a meme actually today um, when I was scrolling through social media. So yeah, still very much uh, uh, in in the public eye, that one. Um, and uh, yeah, most of the matches, I'd say probably the standout match here, considering how much how little time they got, was probably the women's match. Um, if I was going to pick one out, but uh, yeah, thoroughly enjoyable pay per view up until the last two matches. They did what they needed to do to further storylines, and that's about it. Um, so that is Backlash 2003 um, on the 27th of of April 2003. This pay per view was aired live on pay per view. So um, we move on to May. And more pay-per-views. We've got a, uh, a UK pay-per-view. I think it's Rebellion. Uh, that's uh, the May pay-per-view. And uh, 
move on to that one and then we get a, a US pay-per-view as well so if you've liked this uh, podcast this review this rundown of Backlash 2003 for retro reviews on Cheap Shy Entertainment then please do consider subscribing and joining us in conversation and I will see you next time wrestling fans goodbye Hiya!